Special Operations, Covert Ops, Espionage, The Team House, with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to The Team House. This is episode 148. I'm Jack Murphy, here with co-host David Park, D producing here behind the scenes. Uh, tonight, our guest on the show is Fred Galvin. He is the author of A Few Bad Men. Fred spent, jeez, uh, what, what was it, 27 years in the Marine Corps? Uh, yeah, 27 years in the Marine Corps. Uh, served in Afghanistan, Iraq, Kuwait. And he was also a MARSOC officer. He was uh, the officer that was out on what became an infamous deployment, MARSOC's first deployment overseas, uh, that saw him and his men uh, persecuted, really, by, by the military in many ways. And Fred has taken the story of him and his men and compiled it into this book that is coming out on June 7th. Uh, we'll post a link to Amazon for you guys to go and check it out. But this episode, we're going to be talking to Fred all about his career and about this first deployment of MARSOC and the fallout that came from that. Um, and before we get into it with Fred, uh, Dave, you want to give a shout out to one of our sponsors here? Sure. Uh, which one? Oh, Boykies. Uh, you guys, we love Boykies. It's biltong. It's better than beef jerky. Um, it's, it's a healthy snack. Uh, what else can we say about, we love Boykies. If you watch the show, you know we love this stuff. Um, in fact, this is our last pack of it, Boykies. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, check them out, uh, Boykies.com. That's B-O-I-K-E-Y-S, uh, Boykies.com. And Team 10 for 10% off, right, D? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So, Fred, thank you for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it, man. Um, to just kind of jump right into it, could you tell us a little bit about sort of your origin story, about your upbringing and the path that sort of brought you into the Marine Corps? Well, basically what's going on uh, that led me to the join the Marine Corps was a young young kid there in uh, Kansas growing up. Um, we Our family took a trip back to the battlefields of the Revolutionary and Civil Wars in the East Coast, and uh, my mom was actually a travel coordinator. So she met with all these uh, different tour planners, uh, National Park Service Rangers, uh, tour guides, and went on some incredible tours there and had for the first and only time explained to me that, uh, you know, what was going on there. I never had heard anything like that before in my life. And uh, so all of a sudden, you know, here I am seeing, uh, you know, these reenactments, you know, hearing very descriptive stories about how incredible it was to, uh, you know, these guys fight for our freedom. Also, like in the Civil War, fight to end oppression. So it was really moving. And at 10 years old, I didn't have any prior military experience or any family that were in the military. But I I knew right then and there, like, that's something that I, I wanted to do. And that lasted all the way through going through high school. A buddy of mine in high school said, you know, if you want to fight, this was in 1987. It's like the Marines are the first to fight. That's their slogan. And so I'm like, okay, that's a, that's what I want to do. And uh, join the Marine Corps. Actually that guy that uh, talked to me about the Marine Corps, because I didn't know the difference between the army and everything else. He ended up, he enlisted and he had a contract going a week right after high school and he smoked dope on spring break. So he lost his contract and, the recruiter told me, he's like, hey, man, are you interested in going into uh, the ring to boot camp a week after high school? I was supposed to wait till July. And so the guy said, uh, it was about 35 years ago, you know, we got a ticket for you. And I'm like, this is like a dream come true. So I went to boot camp one week immediately after high school and went out here to the West Coast, uh, stationed in uh, Camp Pendleton, just north of San Diego. And uh, that was like a dream come true. Uh, deployed overseas in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and uh, into Saudi Arabia, liberation of Kuwait. Uh, came back. I had previously taken uh, an indoc to get into recon. However, the um, my company executive officer, you know, held that against me. He's like, you know, this is just a bunch of glorified grunts, right. you know, <clears throat> and held that against me and held my head underwater that entire deployment thought I was trying to get out of the deployment or which was nonsense 
But even afterwards, after returning, I was not able to go over and join reconnaissance. So I got out, went to college, and then became a stockbroker for two years, uh, first with an investment banking firm in uh, La Jolla, and then I joined Smith Barney uh, when they were the largest firm on Wall Street. And then, uh, But I really had a desire to get back into the Marine Corps. That took two forms. I tried to enlist again, and I was a sergeant, so they didn't have any boat space for mm-hmm. sergeants. This is a drawdown in uh, the military, 1995. Mm-hmm. Uh, President Clinton was there, so severe cutbacks. And uh, so I put a package in to get commissioned and I picked up immediately and went off and then did the year in uh, Virginia, getting trained as an infantry officer, went straight back out to California uh, to serve as a platoon commander in a uh, first Marine division. And then uh, went over to force reconnaissance, did two tours uh, three years as a force recon platoon commander, one in Okinawa at fifth force recon. And then I went out. Uh, I think the army calls it a trade doc tour, not operational. Uh, I was an instructor at the Marine Corps version of top gun in Yuma, Arizona. Uh, it's called the weapons and tactics instructor course. I was the guy on the ground, the reconnaissance instructor that coordinated hellborne raids uh, and airstrikes. So we'd control massive formations of road rowing and, fixed wing close air support for these massive uh, exercises where an infantry company would come in via helicopter, uh, mortars and artillery would be firing. And uh, we have a team of us. One of us would control the jets, one control the attack helicopters. And then uh, other parts of this, what we call a fist team would call control the mortars and then the other artillery. And, we do all that in about a 50 minute time period with massive amounts of ordnance going on uh, in support of the infantry. Did that for 15 months. Then there was a uh, training fatality in Camp Pendleton with First Force Reconnaissance Company, and they removed the chain of command. The platoon commander, platoon sergeant, team leader, uh, the shooter ended up being in prison for a while um, for shooting, accidentally shooting a, that uh, was through negligence, killed a, a role player. Oh, uh, so man. I kind of got early released out of Yuma and went to Camp Pendleton, California for my second uh, tour as a force recon platoon commander. Uh, did that for three years and then got promoted, moved over in the ops role uh, for the force recon company. And then uh, they got slated as the first uh, commanding officer, Marine Special Operations okay. Command uh, and we deployed in 2007 as a task force and so this to is, Afghanistan uh, we, on the we, border of we did an interview with, uh, was it Pete Perry? Yeah. A few episodes back. And so an enlisted soldier, enlist, enlisted Marine, talking about this yes. experience when he was forced recon and they came back from training and like some staff guy was like, uh, you guys are now this thing called like man sock or something like that. And he's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> so so you're telling it from the officer side. Um, what, what was that like for you from, from your perspective, the formation of MARSOC and, and transitioning from force to, to MARSOC to Marine Special Operations? Well, good question. And I'll, I'll back it up a little bit so we have uh, some perspective and data points, some trends. Mm-hmm. So the Marine Corps was forced to do to get into special operations back in World War II. And what preceded that was the British Royal Marines Uh, Winston Churchill wanted a commando organization to go behind German lines and wreak havoc with their command and control headquarters. Uh, So they formed a little assessment selection up in the Scottish Highlands. And they had, it was from all joint services, but it was under the British Royal Marines and they had a commando force. So when Churchill did that, FDR wanted the same and uh, told the Marines, make it happen. Marines didn't want even the name commando. Um, They settled on the name Raider. They had, uh, you know, four Raider battalions. They fought, they were activated in February of 1942. And while they were fighting in the South Pacific during the island hopping campaigns, two years after their activation, they were disbanded. Stroke of a pen, one sentence from General Vandergrift, the comment on the Marine Corps to, it is not in the best interest of the Marine Corps to have an elite within an elite. so boom, away they go. They mostly assimilated back in the infantry and fought, several of them did on uh, the Battle of Okinawa. Why is that important? Well, as you both know, 
1987 when they stood up the activation of the, the U.S. Special Operations Command. What did the Marine Corps do? That's right, nothing. Uh, second data point, you know, they, they didn't want to participate again and uh, because it's basically dethroning. Every Marine is supposed to be elite. That's the consideration. Right. The Marine Corps is a very ego-driven, self-righteous organization. I love it, but uh, to tell an infantryman in, in the Marine Corps that there's somebody that could possibly train more and have more special skills. That's a, it's like sacrilege. So that, that's the second data point. Third data point, 2001, we were attacked. Uh, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld said, I want all of the joint services to increase capacity of their special operations forces. So what happened, as you guys both know, uh, Green Berets added a battalion per special forces group, those fourth battalions. The SEAL teams added SEAL team seven and eight. Uh, the Marine Corps, uh, they just took a little relax and uh, then they got a little bit more pressure. They sent some liaisons down to Tampa Special Operations Command. They got a little bit more pressure. They tried to slow roll it by doing this Marine Corps Special Operations Detachment One, a proof of concept for two years and stretching to three years that uh, the intention was to slow roll. You know, Bush was expected to be a one-term president like his father, number uh, the younger junior. Uh, they thought he's going to be gone. He got reelected. And well, we know what happened there. He kept uh, Rumsfeld on a second administration. Rumsfeld put the pressure and said, Marine Corps, make it happen. So uh, there was three separate periods in the Marine Corps history that the Marine Corps didn't want and was forced to do this. So when you talk about the activation ceremony, Jack, uh, it was, I was there in Camp Lejeune, February, 2006. It was uh, officiated this arranged wedding uh, by uh, the godfather himself, Dr. Rumsfeld, uh, the commandant of the Marine Corps, General Hagee was there. It was uh, uh, General Brown was there from SOCOM, you know, the, the husband and wife. We were the love child that was resulted in the first Marine Special Operations <laughs> Company. Uh, the intention was to abort this, uh, have us die on the operating table. And uh, I got the sense far before we deployed in conversations with the general that we're not going to have any military construction. We were living in trailers that, you know, the previous Enforced Recon, you had actual 0321 Recon Marines. You had 100 in, you know, five platoons. We had six on paper. But um, so you basically had, a, you know, 100 guys, actual uh, operators on the East Coast, West Coast, and three platoons overseas. So roughly 300 pipe hitters that are uh, doing the job of commandos. Uh, the rest, you know, support personnel. Now, MARSOC stood up a 2,650-man organization, so it kind of opened the floodgates of all these people. They knew they could scale it back, but where did all these people go? Trailers. There was no plans for, you know, putting roots down. I said, hey, what about, I'm, you know, on the way across when I was at First Force Recon in Camp Pendleton, I stopped by Nellis because I had been stationed in the Marine Corps version of Top Gun, so I went out to Red Flag, uh, talked to I realized we're going to fight jointly. So I went to coordinate with the Air Force. I also drove out to Fort Campbell, talked to the 5th Group guys, talked to uh, the 160th, because I knew this time in 2006, people, a lot of people were getting killed and blown up, uh, dying and losing limbs from uh, roadside bombs. So I knew we were going to need assault support aircraft to transport us uh, as much as possible. So that's why I was coordinating with the 160th. Went down to Hurlburt. This is all in the nine days across the country from Camp Pendleton there in San Diego out to uh, Camp Lejeune where we were activated. Went down to Hurlburt, talked to the Air Force Special Operations Command, swung through Bragg, talked to JSOC, talked to uh, USASOC, showed up at uh, you know Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and it was like having the brakes put on. Uh, everything was, you know, I'm talking about, you know, hey, USASOC, you know, they got all this brand new sniper rifles, binocular night vision for depth perception, all this kit and this, no, 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 you're not going to get it. I'm like, hey, it's program records, special operations command. It was everything to shut any type of innovation and technology down. And I'm like, hey, if we do not participate and register these requirements, that just means the 
Rangers and the Green Berets and the Seals are going to get more money. And AFSOC is going to take the lion's share of it. So, like, we are really doing a disservice to these. And they didn't call them Raiders at the beginning. The Marine Corps didn't want that term used. It was a special that that has a different connotation. So, and it also means there's some roots being settled down. And a lot of the World War II Raiders had still lived and wanted that. Uh, so there was this big resistance to that. And we'll just call them Marines. And everything was the McDonald Land menu, Mc, McSob, uh, you know, Marine Special Operations Battalion. We're the MSOC. There was actually, this is not a group of alcoholics, but there was a Marine Special Operations Support Group. That's not a, a sausage <laughs> menu, but it was the M sausage. And it's all these ridiculous terms that made no sense. And so you'd show up and you're talking to, green braids you're talking to rangers and like we're the marsoc guys it was all it's like a boy band you know we're the we're the marsoc guys uh, you didn't have any kind of green bray or seal type you don't really need that but there needs to be some differentiator right. on you have a special skill and a capability uh we're not just some singing group called the marsoc guys right when you were going around to these different elements initially, like doing that that world tour, uh, were they welcoming? Did they keep you at an arm's distance? Like, how were they at the one sixtieth and down in Tampa, and, and you know all these units that you went and sort of yes. connected with? Well, at first I didn't go to Tampa, but everybody else at the regimental levels and below were very welcoming. Um, they didn't have any any the the more specialized like a JSOC them you know immediately brought all of our human and signals intelligence guys and started having them integrate and they shared everything it was, it was that was awesome it was at the higher echelons where <clears throat> I sensed a lot of competition not it at all in the enlisted ranks it was in uh, field grade and above a lot of jealousy a lot of envy uh, uh, without naming names of fifth group commanders like don't even bother talking to the uh, 160th, you know, they were originally, they were designed and spread loaded across the green braid battalions. But then, uh, what do you say? Then, uh, you know, tier one units swallowed them up and, you know, that's all they're, they're not going to support you. They don't even support us. And this is an assumption, but at that time in 2006, this first company that I was the commanding officer of, we were the shiny little, uh, object in the room and the 160th is like, Hey, you know, let's, these Marines seem like a, you know, I had had that experience as a weapons and tactics instructor in Yuma, Arizona. So I could talk the lingo with close air support and uh, ISR drones. And so we made this uh, great training evolution happen with the 160th. And that kind of rubbed some people at the 06 and above le levels off. They're like, hey, how come they're playing with the Marines and they won't even give me support? Um, again, sort of like the story in the Bible about Joseph, you have some favored son that everybody else gets pissed off about, and you know, they're not, it doesn't necessarily make you happy. Um, same thing with AFSOC. So by the time we deployed, we had 11 months, we did uh, our own training up in Hawthorne because we thought we could go to Afghanistan. But then as you both know, if you look at that, uh, tail of the tape from back in 2006, you had this full paper ad in the New York times. With, when the surge happened called General Betrayus. Yeah. General Betrayus was in charge of all American forces in Iraq, and they surged 100,000 personnel in there. It was a very bloody and deadly time. So that was not popular. The Marine Corps, to meet that surge, pulled every Marine out of Afghanistan and surged everybody into Iraq. And so there was a strong tendency that we thought we were going to go to Iraq. However, the first thing I did is let's go up to the high desert in uh, Hawthorne, Nevada. And if we can operate in that uh, type of terrain, it, it's just hedging our bets. You know, I'd been a stockbroker. I'm always trying to, you know, do the what ifs, mitigate risks. Let's, let's get our combat SOPs in a, in a desert, in a high altitude environment. And then uh, we moved on from there, but we were thinking the whole time. And then it sort of to the latter part of our workup, Oh, we are going to go to Afghanistan. And then that died off. You're going to go to Iraq. And it was unknown. So in comparison to the guys that weren't in special operations at that time, what was going on? Well, you guys can tell the story, Jack, when you 
you know, when you finish the Q course and you get a green beret, you know what group you're going to go to, mm -hmm. you know what country you're going to go to. You're probably already told which fob you're going to be in for your entire deployment or be based out of. And same thing when guys get their trident, uh, they first become a SEAL. They know, hey, we're going to go to Iraq. We're going to go to this part of Iraq. Uh, with us, you know, they were just like, <laughs> Daddy needs a new pair of yeah. shoes. <laughs> yeah, just uh, rolling the dice. And, you know, special operations, is, you have a lot of capabilities, but when you have time to plan, it's the, you know, That's adage, yeah. you know, one third for the seniors to make their plan, two thirds at the tactical level to make their plan. Every week we are having meetings. We were the only company in MARSOC at that time. We're the only ones that formed and existed. So it's not like there was a lot of hustle and bustle, uh, miss, you know, focus. I mean, you had one company. Uh, so each week, I'm, and there was no battalion above me. So I was talking to the general and his oh, I G it. staffs on, I had three questions I asked if I can, and these were asked weekly by me to the general, what are, these were my commander's critical information requirements. What is our mission? Are we gonna be doing advise and assist? Are we gonna be training the monkeys? Are we gonna be flying the space shuttle like Chuck Yeager and dating the prom queen? Are we gonna be doing that ourselves? Uh, or are we gonna be doing like these green berry monkeys and training the monkey? Uh, I need to know because that changes how our tactics are. Do we have to get language skills? Uh, so second was, who will we be working for? So I can coordinate with that commander and his staff and get their intentions on how we can support them. Three, I don't need a 10 GZ grid. I need, but I do need a sub-region. I realize we're gonna, there was a little hint that we're gonna go to CENTCOM, but as you both know, that leaves a lot open to your imagination and you can't properly train your force. I mean, CENTCOM goes from the Horn of Africa to, you know, to India. Uh, so uh, lots, a lot of things can change in there. Uh, so, but these weekly discussions, you know, it fell on deaf ears weekly for 11 months. We found out when we got on the USS Baton in Norfolk and started heading east wow. towards Europe. Uh, so, you know, that's, that is a big deal. I know the Marines, it wouldn't be such of a big deal if we actually had the group of ships that we deployed on. And I'll talk about that in a second you know, if we had support from them, but this first task force that we had was ironically engineered to be, to look exactly like the Marines when we deployed on the ships before is a force recon platoon. So we had a force recon platoon. We had an infantry platoon. that was our security element. And we had a massive amount of intelligence capability, which when we got into theater and, you know, from doing the, DOD, the Department of Defense's pre-publication security review, they don't only use certain words, but so I'll talk around it, but there was, uh, I'll just say special forces units in the same area that we were operating in. And there was uh, other government agency uh, personnel in there, but they all looked at our, especially our signals intelligence, like, hey, they started wanting to cherry pick, you know, those goodies right. and get their hands on our guys. So it, that, that didn't really happen, but I'm just saying we came in with a lot of capabilities. There was a lot of room in that, hey, these Marines kind of cleaned the slate. They they did evaluations with AFSOC and the 160th and even in MARSOC and with the conventional Marine Corps on the groups of ships, and they rocked it. So that made a lot of people a little concerned about what – this isn't Force Recon. This is MARSOC. They put us on ship, and I think the Marine Corps wanted us on – the ships. Why? Because of control. Right. Um, right. You know, mm. a couple of years will go by another election and we'll keep it organized the same way as it was when they were on ships before. We'll just right. change the name back to force recon. And um, that ended up, as we all know now, not happening. However, we did deploy uh, a week after we were on the boats. We found we we're going to go to Afghanistan. Fred, one yeah. second. Um, thank you. I'm going to ask you to pick it up right back there. I just want to give a shout out to another sponsor for the show, uh, Sap Gear at sapgear.com. Um, tell you a little bit about these uh, gloves, that uh, these utility gloves that they make. They have a full touch screen capable forefinger and thumb, fold over finger construction to eliminate fingertip discomfort, single layer palm for tactical sensitivity, tactile sensitivity. 
Uh, paracord pull loop, updated palm area, and an elastic wrist for quick don and doff sequence. So these are the Pig Delta Green Gloves. Uh, from our sponsors and friends over at Sap Gear. They make a bunch of other cool products that we've talked about in the past. And uh, if you guys use the uh, promo code TEAM, you'll get 15% off your order. That's sapgear.com. TEAM is the promo code to get 15% off. Yeah, there's some, <clears throat> if you've been using uh, some sort of Nomex or whatever tactical gloves, like step up Upgrade. your game. Step up your game. And uh, also check out our Patreon uh, link down in the description if you want to get access to these episodes ad-free. And there's also bonus episodes and bonus segments and cool stuff. So we appreciate all you out there who support this stream. Speaking of Patreon, uh, I'm going to put the link uh, for A Few Bad Men uh, the, for the pre-order in which, the it, chat. Which, again, is Fred's book, which yep. is coming out June 7th, so just a couple of days from now. But you can go and pre-order it yep. right now. Yeah, well, hey, it's get also it before in the it's... description for everybody who listens afterwards. It's right in the description. Yeah. Um, so, uh, real real quick, Fred, I, I want to ask you, because you guys went from being forced recon to sort of like, you know, this, this you know, unholy matrimony <laughs> and, you know, getting dubbed Marsock, and then you... And then against the will of the greater Marine Corps, you got a little, you got a little bit of that money. You got in on that, you know, that um, special operations One sixtieth birds, man, you're and a big deal now. So what was it like be, be going from, you know, the same guys basically doing the job of force recon with like P PVS fives and field telephones, Vietnam era field telephones to, to actually get in, having some real money and getting that, you know, PBS seven seven Charlie money and that you know Satcom yes. money. You know, there's some credit that is due to uh, the guys, especially uh, some leaders out on the West Coast that had uh, procured some equipment that was uh, all of a sudden we were using equipment. People were looking at, especially uh, intel equipment, uh, some of our communication equipment. Um, yeah, we didn't have all the high-speed mini guns right off the bat, but the stuff that really made the difference as far as uh, in the reconnaissance community, can you communicate? Mm -hmm. uh, can When we're doing personality targeting, can we find the enemy accurately and with a making calculated risk? So that, we had cutting-edge stuff. And when we went into country, like the Tier 1 guys, the other agency guys they were like Ooh, you know they really so on that aspect and there was in that i need to give credit to a lot of enlisted and officer senior officers who made things happen argued cases and got a lot of influence and persuasion to the to the right levels and we had uh, communication equipment yeah we had some we didn't have the best um and, and even I was doing that when I was stationed out in Yuma, Arizona, I learned that the aviators, that they have to think big in terms of dollars in order to have that technology and innovation. They have to think jointly. So as far as having gone through several combat deployments with force recon in Iraq, I was, you know, I'm this weirdo because I love controlling aviation. You know, so we had a ton of high powered designators, uh, we had a lot of, you know, I was coordinating with a lot of units uh, for training with close air support. So uh, getting ordnance off the rails of aircraft uh, was like a specialty that we really, that was important to me, but there was a lot of other people developing that. So when we first got in there, there was not parity, but close to it with uh, what we could do controlling aviation assets with our intelligence assets and our communication assets, we were at or above uh, where a lot of other units were just because a lot of people made the case. And then when the the sad thing is, is like I described stuff with binocular night vision stuff that was expensive per man to get mm -hmm. when those floodgates open, the Marine Corps was trying to shut the floodgates and like, right. no, 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 you, everything you need. I'm like, Hey, this stuff is literally life changing. People are going to get killed. If you're driving a vehicle across the desert at night, in these wadis and you don't have that depth perception this is critical gear that we need and and there was such a there's like a thermopylae defense you know this this uh total resistance like stop don't don't get that technology 
And I was like, that's so crazy that it, the Marine Corps is nuts. like trying trying to sabotage the Marine Corps. You, you know what's funny is, uh, you know, the Marine Corps has you know that motto: improvise, adapt, and overcome, and for and for good reason, right? Because they've had to. But it's sort of like More it's less. sort of it's sort of like. Well, you know, just because you can make a landmine out of bubblegum, tinfoil, and a rubber band can. doesn't mean you have to when you can get real ones. <laughs> so, Fred, can, can you talk us then um, through, you know, you, you said that you found out you were getting deployed to Afghanistan. Um, can you walk us through some of those, ma those main questions? Where, where specifically were you going? What was the mission? Um, what did you guys start doing? Okay, good question, because we anticipated that there was going to, that we were going to go into CENTCOM. We did not know where, and this uh, Rumpelstiltskin secret was said a year prior. So we left in January, but the year prior in February at the activation ceremony, that is when uh, General Brown, okay, of course, he works for the Secretary of Defense. So even though he may not have wanted the, the marriage and the baby, he's, if, if you're a general, we've why did the war last 20 years? I'm going to diverge to reconverge here in a second. Well, it didn't take us 20 years to kick somebody's ass like the Taliban. Uh, there's incentives when a, a war with people using weapons made two years after World War II and homemade explosives to run around in sandals are, are engaging and being decisive against us. That's because you, you hamstring people with rules of engagement. Uh, so, but... It goes back to, you know, we were not given, you know, the information, uh, but I did know at the activation ceremony, General Brown wanted to please his boss because he wants to go work for what? Boards of directors. So they have a house and they're going to get flown in on the corporate jet. You've both been to Dulles and National. You read the names on the top of the buildings around the Pentagon and intelligence community. That's who these, look who's on their boards. And, uh, you know, if uh, you, you need a badge, to get access into the Pentagon, unless you're what, an 09 or an 010. And what are they paid to do? They're paid to influence and persuade and dangle that carrot. You're like, hey, Jack, how's the wife and kids? You know, uh, it was great promoting you the last 20 years, but uh, you've heard this company, Oshkosh. We need, a, we need a rep up there. They make these mine resistance, you know, armored protective vehicles. And, uh, well, Dave, we're going to need somebody like you to, you just think about, you know, where you're in a transition to and we'll get you on the board. Uh, so it's, it look at where they all go. Where'd Mattis go back to right. general dynamics? where general Dunford, when he became uh, retired from being secretary of defense. Oh, that's right. Lockheed Martin. Sec def right now, Raytheon. Uh, I'm not cheese. making the stuff up or embellishing it. So, but the moral of the story is general Brown saw the carrot. I got to please the secretary of defense. Right. And, so he decided, he said at the activation ceremony that when they hit, I think it was the 31st parallel, I went back after I heard that and, you know, got on the computer. Oh, he's talking to Suez Canal. He said, when they hit that parallel, they will be working for the Theater Special Operations Command. So I'm like, okay, that means we're going to be working for Sox Scent. And I immediately started calling down to Tampa at Sox Scent and found a Marine, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Reese Rogers and their G35, the J35, and said, hey, Boss, what are you what are you hearing? You're down there with your ear to the ground. Where are we gonna go? I of course I bypassed and a lot of people got pretty pissed off at a guy named Fred Galvin uh, for jumping all the way down where the point of friction is at Sox Scent, where those decisions would be made eventually. Um, but again, there was just a lot of resistance. You know, the Green Braves, it's it's having Marsoc come in to your AO. Uh, is a task force of, you know, just like a tier one task force, you have a 45 man assault element, a security element, uh, tons of trucks, guns, and uh, intel out the ass. Well, guess what is going to happen? You're, uh, you know, this task force is going to go there and, and, you know, start checking people uh, on the ice. And so that's kind of like a, the mistress meeting the wife, it's not necessarily the competition that the, the house wants there. And so there was some rivalry, especially I noticed with the field grade officers The yeah, there's, you know, there's some uh, comparison of some anatomy parts when uh, you got there with some of the uh, 
non-commissioned officers on the enlisted side, but it wasn't like cutthroat, like screw you and we're not going to support you at all. It's just, it's normal Neanderthal male behavior uh, is you're trying to figure out who's who in the zoo and like, who, who are these commandos checking in here? And uh, because really we had been focused entirely on Iraq since mm-hmm. the start of the war. And uh, we really hadn't, we had a couple guys deployments to Afghanistan, but you know, standard butt sniffing type of stuff. Uh, but the, the upper echelons of the army that were the ones that were, <clears throat> and you'll read in the book and the book is just, it took me 11 years before I even left the Marine Corps to uh, put, put in these freedom of information act requests. Right. I had to fight twice with two different attorneys in federal court to get the, the article 15 dash six investigation released uh, as well as the transcripts from the court of inquiry. And again, I should go in here, uh, talk about what this story is all about. Right. Yeah. War crimes, but yeah, yeah. there's no need for this to be classified at all. So we get into Afghanistan, we do 30 patrols, uh, army officers. One thing about them, they're not stupid. They go to these schools and, you know, they have to be very specific. And I've been to some of these schools with the army and they're, uh, they're real detail oriented army officers. And so uh, an area of operation is defined by boundaries. Those are grids or geographic train features. And it's not just some imaginary, you know, stream of consciousness, like some guy with a cigar, you know, making a mark on a map. Uh, but that's what it was. When we went into uh, Bagram there, like just circled a blurb up there. We did. And I anticipated so we withheld all our intel guys from deploying on the ships because we knew that there would be a decision soon made. And it was days after we got on ship. And then those guys I had fly into Afghanistan and they pushed that echelon out to Eastern Afghanistan where we were going to be in July by the airfield. And, uh, but we, we got out there and, you know, at first I got this uh, guidance from the siege of Soda commander, the army green Brigade colonel from third group that, put a big circle on the map up the Torbor Mountains. This is the last place Osama bin Laden uh, was seen, you know, and it's a, uh, you know, so what do Marines haven't been to Afghanistan thinking like Osama bin Laden? You're just like, Ooh, this is going right. to be some good stuff, man. Right. Like, we're going to go after bin Laden. Like, right. we're, we're the shit now. Right. You know, so, of course, you know, we're, you know, we're motivated and high five. Like, this is going to be great. But he gave me some, uh, Restrictions. He said, I cannot afford to have another Operation Red Wings. And that had happened about two years before. Mm-hmm. Uh, SEALs, this is a book, uh, is, for those who don't know about uh, Lone Survivor, was the, that book and movie was created about. Uh, and we did an interview with Tony Brooks, who was one of the Rangers that uh, went and recovered the remains of, of those guys, um, if people want to go and watch a past episode. But yeah. Yes. So the CG just sort of commanded rightfully. So he said, hey, you must have a quick reaction force that's able to immediately reinforce you. But he wanted us up in those mountains doing, uh, and the French did that before us, the French special forces that were there. And of course, the French and the Alps, you know, that's, uh, that's good times. And, uh, you know, nice boondoggle to yomp around the, the Torbor Mountains in the middle of the winter. It's, uh, but our intel team that was there for a month prior to us was quickly informing me that, hey, Americans built this nice, they paid the, for this nice road, the first paved road in Afghanistan, connecting the capitals of Pakistan and Afghanistan. And there's all this opium and poppy getting exported. And this training sanctuary right next door here, we we're right on the Afghan Taliban, Afghan Pakistan border. The Taliban are training and fully radicalizing these foreign fighters right over here in the sanctuary that we can't get to. They all come not over the mountains in the middle of winter, 14,000 foot snow covered peaks. They're, they're coming right across this, you know, checkpoint that they easily bribe this border guard and they're in. And then they, what's this first town called? It's called the logistics node. That's where they link up with their handlers and they get pushed out to Kandahar, Kabul, Sangin Valley, everywhere to get their jihad on and kill the infidel. So that's what was going on, but we were still, you know, we're following our orders. We'll get up there in the mountains. They approved one overflight for visual reconnaissance. And, you know, I had been an instructor, the Marine Corps top gun 
I saw all these assault support aircraft, 47s, Blackhawks, sitting on the airfield there in Jalalabad, right in front of us, sitting. Did I say sitting? Yeah, that's right. Doing nothing at all. And so there was this disconnect and this disparity from, you know, your verbiage to your actions. And that was at the Siege of Soda. So they wanted us to get up there. Uh, obviously, you've seen the tour borers. You, you can get up on foot. It's still a little bit challenging when it's covered in snow, but that does prevent us from immediately reinforcing them. So we identified from this army military police base that was right on the Afghan Pakistan border and our imagery analysts that we had with us organic to us. We saw some of the areas that were snow melted and we decided, okay, we'll push east and we'll be able to get up there uh, with our vehicles and we'll stage a quick reaction force on this base. Uh, they can move up there in case they're needed immediately. We will we'll do it without the, the helicopters. But they, the Army, their uh, field grade officers or majors and above are like, you're not obeying the colonel's orders. Get up there in those mountains. It's like you heard what the colonel said. You know, that involves certain resources, helicopters, which you won't give us for some reason. You just won't. You know, it's a catch-22. And we have to have a quick reaction force. So, you know, we sorted that out. We didn't know this village that we had to pass through to get to where the quick reaction force base would be staged. We had, I mean, this was a logistics note, body, body co. Mm -hmm. We knew there was four suicide bombers. We had good intel on the actual building that they were in. So on that day of the 4th of March, we had a threefold patrol. We're going to go out and do some face-to-face -face coordination with the Army military police to coordinate what they said, but I wanted to look them in the eye, talk to them and make sure that our Marines that are going to be stationed there as a QRF are not going to be some burden or, you know, screwed around with. And uh, so that face-to-face -face coordination occurred. We got there that morning, roughly about 645-ish. And the Army military police had their patrol lined out. You know, they were doing their immediate action drills, contact front, contact right. And their procedure is our whole patrol of 30 Marines saw they would duck down in their turrets and they'd say, drive, drive, drive. So they're, they're rehearsing to duck and run. And if you've been there to Torquem Gate, you see it's surrounded by steep mountains. So what's on an elevated ground? Observers mm -hmm. and observing their tactics and procedures. So anyway, we were just shaking our head. We made the coordination. We push out south from uh, that base at Torquem Gate and headed into the Tor Bora Mountains for a mounted reconnaissance patrol to see uh, firsthand exactly what's going on in those mountains, how we can get in and out. We spent some time there, and then we got back out on the road for the third uh, purpose of our mission, one, to do the coordination, two, to do the mounted reconnaissance, three, to do a tribal leader engagement in the Body Co. As we entered that village, baseline completely shifted from what it was three hours earlier when we passed through there originally when it was men, women, children, hustle and bustle. Now we just see fighting age men lined up on the side of the road, staring at us. So as soon as I saw that shift, you know, came out of the radio, Hey, watch out that a car bomb detonated blew up right in front of our second vehicle, which was a, uh, that was the anomaly vehicle. It was a high back had a uh, steel plates, uh, with a open air troop compartment mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. up overhead uh, that was used as an ambulance in case we needed. The rest of the five vehicles were fully enclosed steel armored vehicles. Uh, I believe that was likely uh, intentional that they attacked that one that was perceived to be uh, more vulnerable. As soon as that uh, vehicle went off, it knocked the communications uh, equipment out of the vehicle went off on the bumper right at the very front of that vehicle, knocked the turret gunner down in the vehicle. He was on fire, immediately stood to his feet. We stopped there at the kill zone, uh, preparing for us to counterattack. A vehicle came to T-Bone, uh, sports utility vehicle, a Toyota Prado driver, and then three passengers, three passengers hanging out the windows, firing AK-47s fully automatic at us, uh, trying to finish off that uh, vehicle number two. The gunner in the turret stood up, on fire, extinguished himself, uh, grabbed the medium machine gun, uh, commando out of the back troop department, stood up with his light machine gun. They both aimed in and, and killed those guys. The driver bailed out. 
uh, was continuing to fire at us with his AK-47. And we received, once we killed the passengers and the vehicle stopped, we started getting pinged uh, by dismounts on the right side, on the opposite side of the road. So they were having a suppressing element and then the others would bound towards us as they were doing fire and maneuver. We received fire from a uh, sniper fire from a hillside that the U.S. Army Criminal Investigative Laboratories down in Georgia. Later on, they analyzed their metallurgists, um, analyzed the armor on the sides of our vehicles. It was impacted by the rounds of a Soviet Dragunov sniper rifle, oh, which wow. um, I'm going to speed forward here a little bit. But we had an Air Force investigator come out to do the Army, to the Article 15-6 preliminary investigation. You know, call me crazy. <clears throat> That's kind of like having a plumber be your proctologist. Uh, it can be done. It's probably not recommended. Um, you know, maybe if you don't want to sit down the right way for a while, but this guy kind of jacked us up pretty good. And uh, he came out. Uh, and after the in, interviewing the first two vehicles of Marines, no Afghans decided to kick us out of the country. So now I'm going to go back to back to the ambush. So we started getting hit with on the right side of the vehicle, sniper fire. They had a mob of fighting age men uh, swarm at us, drag a vehicle across the road, trapping us in there. So we were there five minutes. We assessed that we could move, uh, although we didn't have communication with the second vehicle. We did hand arm signals. Okay, so after five minutes of killing the fighters on both sides of the road, we fired far above the heads of the unarmed mob in front of us. That separated them like the Red Sea. It was a smart move. And at this time, Marine Corps had this uh, real age-old antiquated edict that every fought, every shot is a lethal shot. Right. So the, the sergeant did a really good job at not uh, firing at people. I mean, we needed to get out of the kill zone at this right. point. We were being trapped in there, but he fired above their heads. Uh, that, that got them out of the way, and we uh, bypassed around that vehicle, came back to the base, and within 20 minutes from being ambushed to arriving back on the base, we get this uh, – you know, a Marine gunnery sergeant comes up in my vehicle, says, hey, sir, this is on the BBC radio already that you guys killed Afghan civilians. And so at that point, you know, you're in this damage control mode. Uh, we go into debrief to get all the information. And we started sending that up to both the special operations task force in Bagram, as well as the local battlefield commander. Uh, so they got that information immediately. The court of inquiry that was later held a year later um, you know, it's on the record stated that they heard our radio transmissions when we were on the X at nine o'clock in the morning that we were in troops in contact. We got hit with a suicide born improvised explosive device. Um, you know, we did a counterattack. So they got that voice and data uh, instantly from myself and the platoon commander that were uh, transmitting that from the kill zone. Uh, so, but there was all this room. And of course, these army majors were like, the Marines, they had to, they didn't, they didn't know. And they were keeping this a secret. They, uh, Colonel, Colonel Haas, he had to get this information from the media. He didn't even know about this, you know, and the Marines failed to report. And it's like, again, in the book, a few bad men, it describes how information was received chronologically. So you had all this room in, in hearsay conjecture, uh, that, you know, was going on. You hear, you hear in the front of the story how the, the Afghans, you know, use these stringers to do this information operation campaign, right. you know, push all this information out that was reinforced with mass rioting across Jalalabad, the nearest town there. And then the president, Shar uh, provincial governor Sharzai complained to the president of Afghanistan, Hamid Karzai, who publicly condemned us, then didn't take long for the generals to buckle and kick us out. Uh, and that was after... The first two vehicles of Marines, no Afghans were interviewed. Uh, so the investigation took a month. But uh, after the second day that the investigator was there, uh, the determination was to kick us out. And just like in the Pat Tillman case, there were facts that were known. Uh, but, you know, they're going to make the, the narrative fit what the decision of the Fred, senior leaders are. The You know, I've, I've told you this before. I mean, and I just to kind of illuminate for the, the public out or the audience out there, I was in the uh, Special Forces qualification course when this happened, and the roommate was 
incredibly strong. And the, the rumor the, the rumors that were going around about you and about your men were that you went through this village in Afghanistan and just wantonly lit up every civilian home there, just mowing down uh, Afghans for no good reason, which is like a black and white day and night difference from the complex ambush that you just described that you actually witnessed when you were there. Um, and this, so this was the rumor that was going around within special operations at that time. Yes. Jack, I've heard you mention that, and I've heard others that went to Army's command and staff. Uh, just down the road here in Monterey, I had a, a Naval Postgraduate School doctor who actually deployed on the ships with us. He was a cultural expert. He provided a lot of good information to us about the Afghan culture. It's, and it was completely coincidental that he was on the ship. Uh, you know, the Marine Corps Court of Inquiry tried to say that the Marine Corps put him at, like, the Marine Corps didn't know a damn, they, they withheld trying to find any information out. This guy just happened to be on the ship and then he got, he was going over and he flew in from Europe to go into Afghanistan uh, to do some studies for Naval Postgraduate School. But I talked to him years later and he said, after this happened, when he was in Afghanistan, he heard when he was there and he said, and this was only just a few years ago, he said, and I've heard to this day from all these senior special operations officers that come through here that you guys killed all these people and got away with murder. And a friend of mine who I'd known before, he was a Marine and he's working for this other agency that will just say that they train local commandos, uh, civilian organization. And he came back from the village that morning and shows up. It's This is described in the book. And he says, hey, Fred, that locals are saying that you guys were drunk and went door to door just like sport killing these people. And I'm like, this guy is serious. He's asking, he's, they swung him. Like right. they, they convinced him. I'm like, I'm like, okay, we left at six o'clock in the morning. Do you see me on the sauce? I mean, right. is, are you, you kidding me? I mean, I was a by the book guy. I'm not saying I had every pair of boots with, you know, right over left with a bridge on the bottom, you know, like, you know, but we didn't roll out to the gate drunk and we didn't even dismount of our vehicles, uh, let alone kill women and children. Women and children were gone. You've seen how in Afghanistan, you know, when they're getting ready to fight, they right. have this mass exodus of the civilians and women and kids. And that's what we saw and that's what we sensed and that's what you know had our heightened sense like okay and <clears throat> well, we could taste what's about ready to come. But uh, I say that the wrong way. Yeah so so let, anyway. let, lay on us then what um what happened? I mean, you said they start an investigation, but like only two days into it, you guys are kicked out of theater at that point. That's right. So then we told the CESOL operations, we uh, headed to Kuwait. And, uh, you know, they were, of course, we knew like, okay, they have to cut my head off. And they cut my senior enlisted's head off too. Um, and, and we knew they were trying to play like, yeah, we're, we're going to, figure out what's going on. My battalion commander was going to come over there and he didn't even, honestly, I think he just lacked the courage because I've never seen or heard of this anytime before or after he had me relieve myself. He was right there, you know, instead of having the guts to say, Hey, you're relieved and, and telling the Marines, whatever he had me go up in front of the command. And I think he did this probably to, you know, inflict the pain. Uh, but, uh, you know, they tried to act like he hurt us out. But in his actual first question, he was believing what the local elders said. He's like, is it true? You guys were drunk? And I'm uh, like, if you had spent any amount of time during the 11 months before we deployed, right. and if you had known my deployment, my reputation, because we, he had previously been the CEO of Second Force Recon, and I was at First Force Recon. You know, we had one active duty platoon that would deploy it you know, go over on these flyover deployments. And that's what first and second force recon did for the first three and a half years of the war in Iraq is we would do a six month on six month off rotation between the East and West coast force recon companies. So he, he had seen that these guys went over to Iraq, ran up the score. These guys were like stacking bodies up like cordwood. He knew what the deal was and you know, that we're not going to roll out and that's you know, the whole idea is ridiculous. Like where are you going to get enough alcohol 
in Af- out in the outskirts of Afghanistan to get 30 men drunk to begin that, with. And, uh, I mean, right. I, can, I can believe that maybe a handful of guys, you know, talk and get their story straight on something, but 30 Marines cooking up a story, and then on top of that, you have all the physical evidence um, that was collected of the ambush. Like, <laughs> come, come on. But so, so tell, tell us what happened, what happened next. Yes. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Then we uh, get kicked out. Go back. There's seven of us. They focus on uh, that. The Air Force Colonel, highly qualified guy, who uh, coincidentally the SOC sent commander that ordered the investigation on us, and he's in charge of all special forces in the Middle East. Uh, Major General Frank Kearney at the time, he had previously six months prior to that orders an investigation against um, ODA 374, who. You know, their team leader, uh, Captain Dave Stafel, had uh, been out with his team on an approved capture-kill mission. Uh, they positively identified uh, the, the insurgent who was a bomb maker. And one shot from his uh, master and Troy Anderson, his uh, team sergeant, shot the guy in the head, one bullet, on an approved capture-kill mission. And General Kearney uh, also did the same thing to... Captain Dave Stafel and Master and Troy Anderson charged him with homicide. So uh, they ended up beating that. But the, the thing is, is the same arm or the same Air Force colonel goes out there and even CID who investigated the ODA situation said, hey, there's this was legit. There's nothing there. No, Colonel Pahana, he's he's one of the few bad men mentioned in the book. And you, you don't just you know hear it, you you see their picture and you read their testimony that is now, there's no reason to be classified. What I described to you, you know, Dave and Jack, that is completely, it's a gun battle. There's right. I'm not talking about Jason Bourne's knock list or locations of submarines at sea or satellites right. in orbit. This is a gun battle. Uh, no reason to classify this. But what happened is they rushed a decision. We get back. They, you know, we lawyered up the seven of us and we're talking, this isn't, uh, you know, jaywalking or, you know, some crazy allegation. This is war mass murder. This right. is, war, this is right. the largest number of alleged Afghan civilians killed by direct fire weapons in the war. Um, you know, you hear uh, Eddie Gallagher, one guy, this isn't one guy killed. This isn't, this is the 19 killed and 50 wounded. This is 69 Maldives. They said that we went, sport killing right and uh had some bloodlust and we're just gunning down uh no so anyway we lawyer up i take a polygraph from the terence victor o'malley president american polygraph association send that to the convening authority uh so the article 15-6 goes from centcom to socom and uh special operations command is term for some reason they they send it to the marine corps and the marine corps sends it to I, for some reason, this is how weak uh, general officers, you know, they wash their hands. Uh, uh, now, the case is obviously goes where it should with the the soft side. The Marine, Marine Special Operations Command should have adjudicated it, but General Halick, you know, he punts it to uh, down to Tampa, Marine Special Operations or Marine Central Command. So the conventional force commander, none other than Lieutenant General Jim Mattis, who was in charge of all conventional Marines in the Middle East at the time. He was the convening authority. He's the one that decided where this was going to go. After we received my polygraph, I was on the patrol. I was one of the seven alleged mass murder. Uh, what does he do? He says, uh, I'm going to have 40, he unleashed 45 criminal investigators uh, out on us, four prosecuting attorneys, seven to one odds against us. Um, and then it narrowed down to two of us, myself and one other. We we're determined we we're going to be the uh, main parties in the court of inquiry, a very rarely used trial. So this trial was used. I mean, a court martial couldn't be convened because there's no crime of facie evidence. There's no bodies. There's no blood. There's no bullets. There's no pictures of bodies in this case. Later, they had pictures and some people said, oh, those were from this incident. They didn't have any of that. So we went to this court of inquiry. Right. The risk of a court of inquiry, and I'm not a lawyer or a C lawyer, but it's there's no rules of evidence. So you can inject 
hearsay, conjecture, and you can turn it into this kangaroo court, which it became. So what happened was, and when you read this book, and I want to do a total spoiler, in the beginning of the book, you receive information that the media had. Mm-hmm. So what? Well, you receive the prosecution's side of the story because they slam us and all these Afghans, you know, televised from this base. And I'm in this gurney. I'm paralyzed. These guys, you know, shot my son. We need to go to America. We need more money. Uh, help me, help me, uh, Mr. Mr. So you hear all this and you're like, damn, these Marines are, they need to go to Leavenworth permanently. And uh, next, um, you you start to, and then the book goes into life stories, some of the character development, but then in the end, you're reading like, what, when we went to defend ourselves, why was there a public affairs officer that came up from Tampa that worked directly for the convening authority, a lieutenant colonel for three and a half weeks. I mean, a media handler, maybe. I mean, Jack, you've got experience. In this. I mean, when you're covering news and stuff like that, you may have a corporal or a sergeant, not a lieutenant colonel, mm-hmm. coming up for three and a half weeks for the better part of a month to handle the media. But if you want to control the narrative and if you're wanting to make sure you control information and nothing's leaked, you, you need a wise guy. and uh, But the Marine Corps should not be compared to or be the mob. You're not there to manufacture evidence. You're there to present evidence. And what they did was they would, during our defense witness, we, they'd all, the colonel, <clears throat> who's a legal advisor, court of inquiry doesn't have a judge, is a legal advisor. So the colonel worked for the convening authority. We're going to go to closed session. We don't have anything to talk about, even character witnesses. So go through all the media reports back in 2008 during the trial and find one character witness that says anything about me. I mean, the the press was there. Right. I mean, these are guys that at that time, the Marines, these senior officers hadn't been in Afghanistan. Right. And just just for for people, you know, who to give them an idea in this court of inquiry, you have Afghans who are appearing as witnesses saying, oh, he killed my family. They killed my family members. They killed this. That this is, that this even, and they've got no proof at this point in time, right? That, that this is uh, all going off of like they're, right. as soon as you guys hit their log, logistics node, they, they plan to ambush you. They do ambush you. When you go into their log- logistics you node know, near Torkham Great Gate, passing into Pakistan, they you 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 lay some hate, kill the people trying to kill you. They get pissed, so they send their PR people to uh, whether it was the military or whether it was uh, um, um, Red Cross or who, whoever it was, yeah, and to say these Marines were drunk going house to house shooting people. Um, an Air Force investigator, no, like nobody looks at your vehicles to see that they've taken fire. Nobody, like at this time, an Air Force investigator is like, oh, sounds legit In, to Interview me. the 30 Marines that, the, that were there. Right. And if this is a murder investigation, the first question, where are the bodies? Where's the body? Where, where's the right. body? Yep. You need you need a body. You need a murder weapon. Right. Yeah, this, this is some. Uh, I'm I'm not Sherlock fucking Holmes here. Right. <laughs> right. But <laughs> an inter- interesting point about the bodies and the numbers. So <clears throat> this is what happened on tail the tapes. So the Afghan National Army's police and then Afghan border police immediately show up. Then that military police patrol, which was rehearsing. We, and I believe the ambush was aimed at them because they knew what would likely happen. And the twofold type of attack, whether it's kinetic and they kill Americans or the Americans succeed and they have a information warfare arm that's launched, uh, they're, they're going to win either way. However, they hit Marines and we didn't duck and run. We, we stood and counterattack. Um, however, the Afghan National Police, the Afghan Border Police that show up there was, they said immediately afterwards, and then the military, U.S. military police roll in. The only body, you, you see this all over the media, is the headless corpse of the suicide bomber. Mm-hmm. So those guys that we killed that had weapons that were shooting at us were immediately, you know, removed. Uh, so there was no evidence right there. But however, all these stories that came out 
uh, from different investigations, from different media sources, there were six bodies, there was eight bodies, it was 10, 12, 13, 16, 18. Finally, they went to 19. But what investigation in America would have a, a question on that? I mean, if unless it's a, you know, a plane crash, the right. civilian plane, you know, no manifest or, I mean, there's usually a quantified number. You can have, you know, enumerate on a manifest who was killed. This was, I mean, it was a kangaroo court. You know, these Afghans, you know, every NCIS went over there two months after. And this is a whole nother story where they dogpiled on us. So NCIS wrote this operation order, how they're going to do it. They're going to, which made the operation order, I'll give it to them, made sense. We're going to send a team to Kuwait, investigate the Marines. We're going to send a team to Afghanistan and investigate the crime. The, they called it a crime scene. So right. they were already, there's a little bit. Right. <clears throat> you go somewhere and uh, you use terms in your report, the victims and the crime scene. Mm -hmm. It's possibly been influenced. Uh, and then when you say you're going to have two teams conduct this simultaneous investigation for, you know, rapid uh, recovery of evidence. And then you spend a month dogpiling Marines in Kuwait and you don't get to Afghanistan for two months. Uh, and you only spend 60 minutes out on the objective. Do you, and, but they did, um, they did uncover a lot of evidence and it was really important. And, and that's what's in the book. So that was like classified and I got mm -hmm. it declassified, you know, that's, Oh, they, so there was brass found in the, the vehicle that was shot, that we shot up. The one that's shown all over New York times, there was brass found in the dry riverbed. Um, so when you hear the information that be in the book and it's all this negative stuff, you're thinking that these Marines need to go to hell. And then towards the last half of the book and you see everything that's in the courtroom, all this made up stuff. Now you hear mil senior military officers, sworn under sworn statements they thought they would be protected for the rest of their lives because this kangaroo court was going to classify this whole thing you read their statements this isn't fred these are quotes of sworn statements on the stand these senior officers making this and you know like wait a second this guy is now a four-star general he's retired all right. these guys got retired the guy who's being nominated right now by and he's going to have his confirmation hearing with senate armed service committee cavoli he was he was in on this fix and he's getting, he's going to, he's being nominated for the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. Uh, there, you see all these guys and it's, it's weird how, I mean, you look at, you know, people that are up there. I mean, you look at the secretary or the chairman of joint chiefs of staff, warrior or well-nourished, you know, guy. I mean, be honest. I mean, the guy was a, a diet team leader. Uh, so he had to been, physically fit at one. He knows what the standard is, right. but are we being led by the best? Why are all these guys getting promoted so fast? And you read in this particular case and you wonder like the morale, especially I'm going to diverge again here for a second. When you look at what's going on in Russia and you see that they have a superior number, superior technology, their training that they had, <clears throat> they have every advantage. So what's the disconnect? Why are they at a standstill? I would submit it's not because they're, supply lines and just the logistics, I'd say a huge portion is the morale. Mm -hmm. And when you have non-commissioned officers and frontline foot soldiers in the trenches who don't trust and don't respect those above them, are they going to fight with everything they have? Or are they just going to kick the can down the road? So this should be important to every American right yeah, yeah. here because we don't have a choice. If the People's Liberation Army pushes 96 miles across the streets, we're not going to watch it on TV. Mm -hmm. Americans are going to go in and fight. We're going to get dragged in by a treaty and we don't have a choice. So if China decides like we're going to do our reunification time now or whenever it is, right. we have to be ready and we have to have forces with high morale. And you, you guys have interviewed other people. I'm not the only one. You've got a pulse on what's going on with the morale of those on the front lines. And I was, I just started working at Tesla a month ago. I was, spent four more four years working as a civilian uh, for the Marines and Special Operation Command Pacific out in Hawaii. Uh, we all know what's going on in our forces right now. And for those that don't, because you're not in the military or haven't been for a while, you, you need to, you know, put your ear to the ground and figure out what's going on. And are we ready? Uh, what is the, 
senior echelons like? Is it corrupt? I mean, how was Afghanistan handled last August? Yeah. Has anybody right. been held accountable? Right. Um, how does that affect morale after people fought there, had many friends died and wounded there, and you know nobody's taken accountability? We have this goat rope retreat, is what it was. I'm not talking a uh, a massage retreat. I'm talking about uh, a retreat, a, a full retreat like what we did. Um, that's that is embarrassing, and that's why it's less than a year later Russia invades Ukraine. Uh, something else you don't hear about in the news, which is happening left and right, is, you know, old Uncle Kim is launching missiles out of North Korea left and right. Uh, what are we doing about it? Why is that happening so much? It's because we're a joke. Uh, yeah. Our military leaders are perceived in the international arena as weak. What, but, what do you think? Did you ever draw a line between, like, the, these officers that went on record, but they didn't think it'd be on record because they thought everything would be classified, which – is again yes, weird because it, was it wasn't yeah it, it was it was all classified and it's and like you said it's not it wasn't some super secret like operation no. you guys were running it was it was a criminal investigate well you know it was this but did you ever find like what what happened did did somebody make you know jump to a conclusion that everybody else started piling on did their dislike of of Marsoc and wanting to get rid of Marsoc is did that have anything to do with it? You it, know, it, it almost feels like well, per, it personal the way they came after you, and it's like, did Fred sleep with the commandant's wife or something? Like, what the what the hell is uh, this? What is this really about? You know, I mean, you know what I mean, Fred. That like, it, yeah. it it's so clear that there's so much evidence in this case um, that this was a, a legitimate military engagement. And yet, even after that um, began to come out, they continued to, I'll, I'll use the word, persecute the, your Marines. Um, and, and, and to Dave's point, I mean, did, were you ever kind of able to um, connect the dots there as to, to why that happened? Well, some of that involves an assumption that because I'll use the hallmark phrase, when you care enough to send the very best, you send... 45 criminal investigators. That's unprecedented. That didn't happen in Haditha. That didn't happen in Hamdaniya. Uh, it happened in our case. So in, in those cases, we're going on simultaneous to ours mm -hmm. with nearly as large numbers, but just in, well, in the Hamdaniya case. Um, but in Iraq, he fill mine up too. Please. Um, anyway, uh, <clears throat> I could just take a pull from the jug. But anyway, um, yeah, it did feel personal because you know, this was a situation, you know, at the 20 year mark that I had been in service, like nothing. I mean, here was the elite of the elite. And I really did feel that, you know, there's resentment just because the Marine Corps didn't want to get into this. Right. And we were going to be the fall guy. Right. We were the disposable heroes that they wanted to go down into. So some things going on that I've learned since, uh, you know, being from Kansas, I wasn't a politically, I didn't grow up with a political identity or anything. Didn't know politics, period. But what was going on in the background in 2007? We're heading into a general presidential election cycle. So like I just had mentioned previously, there's this ad with a surge, a full page thing, General Betrayus. It was really ugly in Iraq. And what do you have going on in Afghanistan now? Now this narrative, false narrative, now these Marines are killing civilians. Uh, you know, who's the incumbent? A Republican. Why are we putting these guys in Afghanistan? So making this whole, you know, you see these themes and messages and in information operations. And I, I realized that we were a pawn in this political play uh, that people were felt we were expendable. And uh, so I didn't realize that right away. But then I realized that once they made their decision and they kicked us out, we we're the first unit and only unit in the Marine Corps to ever be kicked out of a theater. Uh, the Marine Corps you know, is a, it is an awesome organization formed in a bar there in Philadelphia by a bunch of the bar owner was pouring booze down these guys' necks. You know, that guy was our first commandant of the Marine Corps, Samuel Nicholas. And he was telling these mates like, Hey lads, we're going to, you know, they, of course they were drunk. Uh, that's, that's a given. And like, we're going to kill these British, you know, we're going to, we're going to savage them. And, uh, you know, so it's a good organization. This book isn't about anti-American or anti-Marine Corps. It's about a few bad men, just like the title says. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if somebody's done all these great things, but if you betray and you come after it to cut the throat of your 
Marines, when you know they're innocent, I mean, they had my polygraph. They had all the statements, they had 30 statements from the Marines, every one of us on that patrol. Um, and you go along with a narrative that you know is a lie. And it's not like this hasn't happened. Everybody understood what happened in Corporal Pat Tillman's case. They knew what the truth was, mm -hmm. and they made a decision to go in a different direction. Right, right. They knew what the facts were. And facts can't be changed, but they did change the narrative. And and we, we evolved, Jack, Dave, we been involved in information warfare and psychological operations that's that's part of the maneuver that we're you know we integrate into and you can do that to the enemy you cannot do that to your own forces you cannot do that legally to the american people right. not with the department of defense and and that is as you said dave <clears throat> you know some of this you know was classified well the, they classified it it's really truly for what it is is it's censure uh -huh. It is not American. It's not what any Americans, we don't agree on. I mean, some people went after, are going after my boss, Elon, because he's a, you know, wants to have free speech. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that is an American, you know, one of the things that we should all agree on is freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of vote, freedom of bear arms and worship. But, uh, you know, the, uh, they decided what people were going to hear and they're not going to hear mm -hmm. a few bad men, is open kimono uh, story about what truly happened. And I fought for 11 years to get that information declassified. Here it is. So, yeah. uh, so let's, let's, let's continue with, with your story. What was the ultimate result of that court of inquiry? What, what ended up coming out of that? A good, good, very good question. So three and a half weeks in the courtroom, longest trial in court history, longest war crime. And, and for the largest alleged number of alleged killed and wounded, by direct fire weapons, machine guns, and rifles. But um, three and a half weeks in the courtroom, media out of it most of the time. And they deliberated. They presented in uh, April. Usually you have a verdict the next day. <laughs> Why they took that long. And this was very sensitive. But when you when you have to wait so long, there's, there's political reasons. It's not that the boss is so busy. I mean, this was a big case. This was right. international media. You right. guys are hearing it all over the military. It's all over the news around the globe. But uh, they briefed the convening authority, and they used non-legal terms. So they didn't say innocent. I mean, you guys, have, I'm not asking if you've, you know, been the, been the accused, but you've probably observed as a spectator, maybe the accused. Uh, <clears throat> but military justice cases end in either innocent guilty or dismissed but in the longest war crime with the largest number and you say and you put it out to only one news source on a friday night just like tonight mm -hmm. and we know in the media world that's called a friday night news dump especially when it's they selected the day four days after four months four four months after the trial yeah on memorial day weekend Oh, like yeah. We just had yeah. They're, tr they're, they're trying to bury it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Because what happens four months on a Memorial Day weekend, there's very few, because we know like this time of year, there's not a lot of holidays after uh, President's Day and Martin Luther King Day. So they waited and waited and waited. And then they put it out in what happens in the Pentagon when you want some news to be buried with what happened in the stock market, what happened overseas and this and that, you're going to have all these other higher priority events that over a four day military weekend, which it was, they dumped it on Friday night of Memorial Day weekend, you know, 14 years ago, last Friday, yeah. they dumped it. And uh, they use this phrase, the Marines acted appropriately according to the rules of engagements and tactics, techniques, and procedure for a complex ambush. And some people can say, well, you guys were exonerated. Really? Why did the media, you know, for another eight years until I retired and got out and, and I, we just kept getting, you know, these drive-bys in the media saying, well, they got away with murder. They, right. they kept saying they never said they were innocent. Right. And that's true. Right. So the media was reporting the information that the media had. Right. But when you don't give them anything or you don't use legal terms such as innocent, or guilty or dismissed. Right. They leave it open. Go. They leave it open for interpretation. However, somebody and wants the, to and the statements it. of your men are all classified at this time. Right. It, they were. And actually, when you talk about censure, they gave us a quote unquote protective order. So you tell me if this is protecting you or is this more aligned to censure? 
the order was, you know, while General Mattis was a convening authority, it stated that if any of us, to include our attorneys, speak to the press during, before or during this trial, that we will be punished according to the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And if because we had civilian attorneys, they said that we will send a letter to the bar requesting that they be disbarred. Uh, so, I don't think that's even need? lawful. I don't think you can lawfully say that to a civilian attorney. Yeah. Well, uh, I've got the letter. I've got a copy of the letter. And so we had this gag order put on us and I complied with that. And then I retired the day I retired, Jack, uh, military times run this hit ad on me saying, you know, Fred Galvin killed 19 and wounded 50, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I contacted that managing editor I'm not friends with, but he, all he did is change the words that we killed up to 19 and wounded 50. And I, but I gave him my polygraph. I gave him the executive summary from the court of inquiry. I told him like, what you're writing is not based on any facts. Right. You need to stop writing it. He just modified it, but it had the same meaning. Uh, six months later, after I retired as the Marine Corps high holy day called the Marine Corps birthday, Marines found in a bar there we all celebrate it. We all get drunk. And like everybody, that's the intention to do, to celebrate, eat some cake and drink some rum. And then, uh, so on that day, they did another drive by same news source. I uh, said, we, they used the phrase, we killed up to 19, 1 and 50. So at that time, I'm like, I'm not calling the managing editor. I'm going, I'm a business owner. I'm going to call the president of the Gannett media corporation. And I had an earful with him. He sent two guys out for six days at two separate times out to Kansas, where I was uh, from and moved back to. Uh, they interviewed me and I, I had a lot of that information that I fought to declassify. Uh, it was coming in, I got more as the time went on, but I gave to them uh, just a ton of it. They wrote a five part series, which- uh, I remember that. 2016 won the Presidential Ford, President Ford Foundation Award for reporting on the Department of Defense. Uh, so, so I started, you know, I had a business. I was going to grad school. I was taking care of her dying sister and uh, had a gold star charity. I was busy moved, trying to move on with my life. Mm -hmm. um, but they would still do some more. Uh, Washington Post did a drive by. And that's what led me, Dave, to want to, you know, put this in a form, request all the information. Right. Uh, so Americans know everything about what went on right. uh, from their sworn statements. These are what these senior officers said under oath in court. It's unadulterated. It's not paraphrased. Uh, I know Nick Kaufman, he wrote several articles. And when I was in China on our MBA residency, um, I was, I was his enigma machine because I was giving him all this declassified information that had no reason being classified to begin with. You know, the security classification guide prohibits anyone from classifying something for the purpose of saving someone from embarrassment. Right. And this is textbook, just that. Again, it's censure. So I was the enigma machine that was defining what nouns, who was talking about what uh, to, to Nick as he was writing that series in the soft rep uh, in 2016, which was, very, very in depth and described. And Nick, he just posted page after page. I mean, it's it was redacted, but he put in who was talking <laughs> from what I was giving him. Uh, but nothing like this book is the same way. It's not paraphrased. It's not edited here and there. It's but it is is as you guys both know me. Um, you know my game. I just learned to walk upright. I'm still you know half caveman and. This is not written in military jargon. It's in plain la language. It's written by Salmana, who's uh, written other books, written for Playboy and Los Angeles Times. He's a professional journalist, and it's written in a very clear, understandable language right. that uh, the story comes. It's you. You will be kind of twisted and turned several times based yeah. on how this information warfare played out chronologically. You'll think we're guilty. And then you'll think we're innocent and you'll think we're guilty again. You know, and Fred, it's it's interesting because, you know, the military put a gag order, order on you and yet they also released your name to the public. So, right, like your name was released to the public. People knew, like, you don't know who, who r random Marines are, right? A Marine <laughs> serving right now, you don't know who they are, but the public knew your name, but but the details were classified, what people are saying, right? 
Yes, so that's a good point too. Um, it fits along with this information warfare. One of the things you're trying to do in information warfare is cause doubt and demoralization. Right. Um, so in, without trying to turn this into uh, psychological operation one-on-one, um, they did use not just our names. They allowed the media to take our photographs. Uh, there was two of us, myself and one of their co-defendants. Um, I was the one I entered the courtroom in the front of the courtroom. So they took the pictures. You see those on the internet, me entering the courtroom, but what was I wearing? And this is a court military court, um, war crimes case, a serious one. Do you see any other cases? How many Haditha where you see them in their camouflage utilities? Not, I'm not talking for an article 32 hearing. I'm talking a court, right? Name one where you see a Marine walking in and out. You know, this isn't some non-judicial punishment right. in front of the battalion commander. This is a court. What do you see me wearing? I mean, do you want to put Marines, some of the most decorated Marines, uh, wounded in action, multiple combat deployments, uh, highly decorated force recon commandos, uh, first Marine Special Operations Task Force commander, do you want to have them walking in their service uniforms? Looking like Jack Nicholson? No, not at all. We we were ordered to wear our camis. Um, so not only did they use that tactic and give our names out, let the media photograph us. They gave our these. We're not boasting. This is just facts. We were Marine Special Operators accused of killing, mass murdering right. Afghan civilians. And when you give what they did is they gave our names, our hometowns, our age. Is I mean. That kind of publicly right. identifying information is how how sound is that? Right. Uh, when these, I mean, we were under fire. We fought our way out of an ambush. We're getting dumped on in the courtroom, and then the military it doesn't leak. They just give it to them. Um, but is that taking care of your Marines? Is that what, protecting them? What Hell was no. uh, Fred? I'm just curious to know what was the impact of that all of this had? What happened to those 30 Marines? What's happened to your enlisted men and NCOs? Uh, in the aftermath of this? Yes, great question. So uh, there's two of us that went in the courtroom. The other one ended up uh, having some severe cancer, had to have surgery and radiation, uh, severely affected him. His platoon sergeant, who was, when I mean, these were force recon guys, uh, just going back and forth to and from the war for several years and then going, Smarsox activated, going back out. You know, he ended up getting diabetes. So, like, the stress from that, uh, the three of the four of us who were married, you know, we did strong point our youngest Marine uh, because the attorneys that I hired, they said, who's your youngest and who's married? And we had our youngest Marine, he had a one-year-old son. And uh, I said, I'm going to made the deliberate intention that we're going to have the uh, civilian attorney that lived he was just had retired and lived outside the gate, in Jacksonville, North Carolina, like, you know, hooks, you're going to be, uh, you, we're matching you up with, uh, Phil Stackhouse because I need you to be able to go see him face to face. Anytime you you're stressing out about this mm -hmm. because they, they did the whole Terminator moment. They cut their arm, pulled it back. And, you know, we had our, Whoa, shit, this is real uh, moment where it's like, Hey, they said they're going to come after, the youngest and who who's the most vulnerable, they're going to dogpile on him. So we made the intentional decision. So to answer that question a little bit more clearly, it affected our guys, but uh, Hooks, who you know, he's still in the Marines. He's a Raider. He's deployed right now. And he, his marriage survived. He's got a great family. It's incredible. So some, so some of these guys did pull through this, this, uh, you know, scandal, if you will, um, and emerged on the other side of it. Yes. Uh, you know, in the long run, they did. I won't say that there was not a long struggle in mm -hmm. some of them. I will say this and, uh, you know, just talking to people now and since that when you have some crucible moment, um, you need to get yourself away from the whiskey and the, yeah. the prescription medications. You need to be on a straight and narrow. Um, I've had uh, one of these gals I used to date. She was a Navy nurse. She said, Fred, you know, she went on to do some uh, med mental health credentialing. And she said the what we have found is that unless you believe in a, a higher power, when, when you truly, you're not, Oh, I'm crazy. But when you have some severe post-traumatic stress, 
that if you don't believe in that higher power, the the chances of your recovery, she says, were negligible. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's almost you're you're going to be affected negatively the rest of your life. So, um, but I did have a, a friend of mine that I went to a tactical air control party school, uh, calling in airstrikes to be a joint terminal attack controller. He, he was Navy SEAL. The two Navy SEALs uh, I went to the school with, and one as soon as I, I mean, there's not a course you take at the Marine Corps basic school that says, Oh, when you're accused of war crime, here's the procedures you need to follow. Right. You know, it's, it's enumerated here. Just follow this and you'll be good. Um, there's nothing like that. So I was like, who, where do you go? Right. And I reached out to some strange bed company and talked to these Navy SEALs. I went to school and they were my friends. And this one guy, before he hung up the phone, he said, Hey, Fred, one other thing, you know, make sure you PT hard, get as hard of exercise right. as you can every day. And, and he did in his, his, uh, that was the guy who was the platoon commander, his assistant platoon commander, who I was a closer friend to, uh, who, when we went through the school and then I brought him out to Yuma and we were controlling, uh, airstrikes. I mean, this dude was just a mountain of muscle, just a total, total beast. Uh, and he's the longest surviving person to this day with baboon lungs replacing his. So all I'm saying is, is this has severe physiological and mental side effects on people when you're accusing them of war crimes. And sure. then not just that, when you are innocent and you fought yourself out heroically from a fight right? and you get back and you expect the Taliban to do this information warfare, but when your own are betraying yeah. you, and that's the key point in this book is not just the betrayal, but how do you overcome it? Right. And that's what a few bad men is all about is we as Americans weren't, you think, man, we got inflation right now. We got high taxes. We're paying full price. You know, the, the number one line item, the non-discretionary spending after all entitlements are paid is the department of defense. Right. So this isn't cheap. Right. Why not get what we're paying for? What, I mean, what if you're you... driving? Oh, I'm ahead. sorry. I'm sorry about that. Oh, go ahead. Finish that thought. I apologize. I'm just saying like, if you're driving the Rolls Royce, you better get the full package and everything that comes with in that warranty and better not let it fall apart. And that's what's going on right now with our military. We've, we've seen a hijacked. Right. You see all this stupidity and re-engineering going on and the morale is so low, but it's not like we're getting it at a discount. It's, it hasn't become any cheaper. It's getting more expensive and we will be called on China. Isn't doing these amphibious rehearsals for general purpose. They're not just like, we don't have anything better to do right now. They're doing it because they're planning to take Taiwan and they're going to push across those straits. It's going to come and we're going to be in a fight with them and we better be ready and we better have morale. And that is not going to be some uh, enemy that's wearing flip-flops. That's going to be a determined enemy that has fifth generation fighters, drones, everything. And we're going to be, we're going to be needing our very, very best. And are these leaders that you read a few bad men, it'll make you sick to your stomach. Do my recommendation. I've told people is I just recently reread the, the hardcover is yeah. advanced copy is do not read this before you want to go to sleep. It will, it will piss you off that bad. Yeah. It will yeah. make you so angry that this happened to warriors and that these leaders got away with it. And these people went on to get promoted right. four stars right. and rewarded handsomely. And, and uh, we, we saw that like with Danny Colson too, we, we, you know, where, where people, uh, well, no, I'm not sorry. I'm sorry. Not, was it Danny? No, who was blamed for, uh, who was that we interviewed who was blamed for the Waco? Uh, that was Danny. It was Danny, right? Yeah. Where, you know, they have these stellar careers like yourself, you know, you, and then, leadership somewhere in the government speaks and and it's treated as law before they're even given it before you're even given a chance to defend yourself yes one one thing i will also i really want to emphasize this is not a one-off and i wish it was and i hope to god there's no sequel to a few bad men too right however a current mission in progress is the Marine Special Operations Command, the command I was in when this happened, is hunting down three of their own right now from a situation, as you may know, that uh, three uh, guys from MARSOC, two Marine gunnery sergeants, E-7, and a corpsman were out in Airville, yeah. and retired Green Bray hit them, uh, punched Danny Dreyer. The media doesn't want to cover any of this. Why? I don't know. 
Danny was a gunnery sergeant, African-American, punched in the face twice, guy coming in a third time. Uh, his mate punches him in the face one time. Uh, retired Green Braves, 275 pounds, hits his head on the ground, dies four days later in Germany from asphyxiation on his vomit. Tragedy. That was not intended. These guys used one punch. They did not just what special operations teach, use the minimal amount of force. Mm -hmm. They do what Marine Corps martial arts program. Every Marine is trained and it has to be qualified in this self defense. And, and I mean, they, they, they picked them up and took them to the hospital too, didn't they? They reported it immediately. They oh. took them back on the base. They said, hey, make sure Chief Eric Gilman treats him. He was the 18 Delta Corpsman. And they did. And they observed him. And, but it was, it's totally unintentional. So now all three, does this make sense? Because everybody's like, that, that's crazy. All three are charged with homicide. And then get this. So uh, the prosecuting attorneys attempted this last year to put a gag order on these three as they're heading into their court marshals and uh, courts marshals tries to put a gag order on it. The judge, uh, Colonel Scott Woodard, who was, you know, the, in the arraignment hearing as they tried to, say, hey, we want a gag order on them. Uh, Colonel Scott Woodard was the defense attorney for my co-defendant in our MARSOC 7 trial. He was like, absolutely not. There will be no gag order on these guys. Mm -hmm. And then is this has gone on, dragged on for three and a half years. So we have the situation that occurred this last November and December. So in November, uh, the, the case has gone on for three and a half years because it's a weak case for the government. You know, it's basically saying you don't have the right to self-defense. Mm -hmm. It's a sad situation. Somebody died. But when you're attacked, this is why grown men should not be fighting, uh, especially grown men trained to kill others. Mm -hmm. uh, so the government's case is weak. Uh, a colonel from headquarters, Marine Corps Judge Advocate Division up in the Pentagon goes down to Camp Lejeune and tells eight defense attorney, military defense attorneys that – your fitness reports can protect you, but on the promotion board, the colonel, who's the staff judge advocate, he'll know who you are and you're not protected. So he states this to these eight Marine attorneys. Which who is all un un undue command influence right off the bat. Exactly. And then so the, the judge in so the first trial has occurred uh, with Chief Eric Gilman, who's charged with homicide, charged with homicide. And he medically treated uh, Rodriguez. Uh, charged with homicide. They threw his case out with, uh, dismissed it with extreme prejudice. Notice I use the term dismissed because that's a legal term, right. but he dismissed it with extreme prejudice. Right. The government's wanting to file an appeal in that case, but the two Marine gunnery sergeants, uh, their Marine Raiders are still in the gauntlet under fire. And, you know, mainstream media doesn't even want to talk about this at all. Right. So right. my point and this tragedy highlights that when good men do nothing, you know, evil prevails, the old saying, uh, it actually emboldens those with the criminal mind that think that, you know what, we did this before, we'll just run a number six on them again. You know, we have absolute power. Uh, now, Marsak is a closed loop. They're even bringing all the Marine Raiders out of Camp Pendleton, California, back to Lejeune's. Putting, so if you're in this loop that you're not going to get out of and you're all in one base, what a strategic uh -huh. and tactical nightmare. But do you think the convening authority, who's Major General Glenn, the commanding general for Marine Special Operations Command, do you think he's holding, a, after three and a half years, a court-martial for no reason? Do you think those Marines have any pressure or any influence uh, by the convening authority on their promotions, their retentions, their right. next assignments. Uh, but in again, the civilian again, court, again, you don't have a jury under that kind of influence. Fred, I mean, again, the the question I have is why? Uh, why is the Marine Corps persecuting Marines? Like, what's the point? And let's be honest with ourselves. The American public itself doesn't give a shit about this case. Like, a couple, a couple Marines punched a guy in the face in her bill, and, and as you said, it's tragic. And I, I don't I don't blame anybody for doing an investigation into it. But John Q. Public doesn't give a shit. And even in your case, unfortunately, um, a bunch of yeah. Afghans get killed, supposedly, and some Taliban people say maybe some people got killed. The American public doesn't get, it couldn't even point to Afghanistan in a map. And I'm not again, I believe in accountability and oversight and uh, doing an investigation to get to the bottom of it is the right thing to do. 
Um, but my question, when I say it doesn't like it doesn't matter or people don't care, what I mean by that is what is the incentive? What is the point of the Marine Corps persecuting Marines when there's no? It doesn't seem like there's any tangible public, well, public good or, or public interest. Or a frankly. public outcry, right. like pressure being put on them to, you know, to to, to lie. You know, it, it's like they're eating their own because for their own gratification, which not is weird. because of anything else. What, 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 which would be weird, too. What, what's, yeah. again, what's the point? Well, two, two points that you guys make that I'll address. So, one, because the public doesn't care I mean, again, this is the nation's largest employer until just recently. If you stacked up Amazon and Walmart on top of each other, as far as head counts of employees, it wouldn't in, until just recently, the two of them combined uh, just exceeded the total number of active reserve civilian and contractors in the Department of Defense. So this is but should we care the nation's largest employer? Now, Amazon can't put you on bread and water. Walmart can't you know, imprison you for life. Right. Uh, the Department of Defense sentenced ma the former Major Hassan Nadal, rightfully so, to death. Right. He will receive the death penalty. Uh, so there's extreme consequences in this type of poker game. And now you ask motive, like, why would they do that? Is this, this is supposed to be a merit-based organization. Have, have you guys, uh, when you're a Green Beret, have you ever been looked cross-eyed by, by some guy in the conventional forces, or have you ever been in uh, a special forces group where somebody who's uh, slacked off and starts to look at you like a competitor uh, who, when you are at your very best, maybe it's just intellectually, maybe it's physically, maybe it's tactically, maybe it's all of the above, and you start to eclipse uh, some of those that Maybe they're more senior rank. You ever read that chapter in the Bible where they said, you know, Saul has killed thousands and David has killed tens of thousands. Did that uh, encourage Saul? No, it pissed him off. And the Marine Corps is a very similar, very prideful, egotistical, and self-righteous organization. And the leaders, you know, need to be able to not have that affect their emotions and their decision-making, but they did. And when you read this book, you see, point in blank how these senior leaders testified under oath like they're not making sound logical decisions right right they're letting emotions and they're letting a narrative that they all went along with influence what they're saying coming out of their mouth and they just they they all fall on their sword and that's that's why it was so important for me because i was the defendant one of two in the in the trial and you're you're, I'm listening to all this stuff, and it was bizarre uh, that the media is not there, that none of this is public. And I thought it would never be public, and I had to fight like hell to make sure it was. And here it's in one place. And again, if you care for our national security, if that means anything to you, if you think that you're a little pissed off that the price of gas here in California is $6.37 a gallon, and the inflation in some areas is over 28% year over year, if that makes you mad, just see what happens when we go to war with China and all the the chemicals that we use for everything in in our homes. Right. Doubles and triples. Uh, and they have control. Look what One Belt, One Road did in the last 20 years when we were horsing around in the Middle East. And these guys were brokering deals with client states from one side of the globe to the next. And, you know, who was getting rich? Uh, a lot of retired general officers. Right. Uh, who are... Who are the, you know, the, the made men in this uh, circle game that, you know, they leave, they retire. Where where do they all go? And is Fred Galvin making this up or just just look where they go? Yeah, is General so Mattis, Fred, remember that company, Theranos, that he was a board yeah, of directors yeah. for? I mean, and they said this last year, he testified, the general didn't know. I had my own money in it. Right. Well, so, of course, you're hoping to get rich, but Fred, you can't say because when you were a four-star general in charge of Central Command – all the forces of the Middle East, you sent emails to the Pentagon saying, tell me what obstacles need to be removed so that we can use this in Afghanistan. So if you're pushing and if you're coercing people to use this stuff, and then you go work for their board, you better damn well know it's going to be working or what it's all about if you're 
advocating this being used on people before the FDA approves the damn thing. Right. Fred, um, uh, complete uh, ignorance. T tell us then, um, since you know, you're pretty passionate about this subject and it's the title of your book. Tell us who, who are the few bad men in your book? Let's, let's throw some, yeah, let, let's, uh, let's, let's get a little spicy here. Let's throw some shade, okay. uh, since, since we have you here. I mean, who, who are yeah. the, who are the bad men? What did they do and where are they now? Okay. You guys may want to knock a few of these back while I'm telling this story. <laughs> uh, because this book does, it not only names them, it as you're reading about these people, it shows you the photo, the black and white. If you get the hardback version, it's in it's in black and white because I know a lot of Marines, like myself, we like to crayon. You know, sometimes we'll even eat the crayons. <laughs> but you can fill it in. And it as it describes them, it gives their testimony, which these guys thought would never be made public. I fought and here it is. So I realized it's a matter of time before I'll likely be assassinated. I'm just joking, but it's uh, probably been in somebody's head. Uh, this is coming out like a piece of radioactive waste delivered by Amazon in a lead suit at your doorstep. Uh, this is not uh, friendly to general officers, but who are the made men? Uh, one is Colonel Patrick Bahana, Air Force uh, Special Operations Officer. Um, he was the one that General Frank Kearney, who is the commanding general at uh, Special Operations Command Central, he was uh, General Kearney was the Geppetto uh, pulling the strings on uh, Pat Pahana, uh, having him do what he did to ODA three seven four in a steering investigation in a in a knowingly wrong way. Then what happened there is, you know, Sock sent referred it to SOCOM. Like I said, SOCOM uh, sent it over to the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps is like, you know what? We're not going to let this uh, Marine Special Operations Command handle this. We'll give it to a little, somebody a little bit more senior, Marine Central Command. We got a guy over there that he knows what to do. They gave it to General Mattis. Uh, do I think General Mattis is innocent when he had my polygraph and he had uh, 40, he ordered 45 criminal investigators and four prosecuting attorneys to come after the seven of us and then just aim in on the two of us and then just aim in on me? I think that's coincidental. No. Did I see that happen in other war crimes cases going on? There's a reason we're called MARSOC 7. There's the Hamania 8. There's the Haditha 8. Um, ours was given some special treatment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I'm a little pissed off because our guys got that wire brush, and it's affected their lives, some to this day. Uh, that doesn't feel good. And uh, we've asked – I mean, Congressman Walter Jones is one of the good men. He, he stood up the – Congressman, late congressman uh, from the district uh, we were in, in North Carolina, second district, he, having not known or seen us, he said, these Marines' rights have been maligned. He goes, why has their presumption of innocence been discarded? Uh, he's one of the good men. You had uh, Colonel Nicholson. Now, you know, he's a four-star general. John Nicholson is retired. He's uh, in charge of all forces in Afghanistan, which, yep. how'd that go over in Afghanistan? Um, exactly. But, you know, he was the one that made a public statement voluntarily to the press, to the Pentagon press corps live from Afghanistan. And you guys remember this. This is the one thing that was famous about our case because nothing before has ever <laughs> been said. So, so condemning against Americans. Uh, he said, this was a terrible, terrible mistake. This was a stain on our honor that American Marines killed innocent Afghan civilians. And he humbly and respectfully, uh, you know, asked for forgiveness. And then he went around and paid salation payments, the equivalent of four years average an annual salary to everyone he could at this uh, Shura. So um, yeah, he's, he's highly featured in this book. And uh, then there's just other Marines that could have, um, you know, supported us. And they, they weren't as criminal, but we did have a um, Marine liaison uh, to, that was over there in Bagram at the uh, command, combined uh, Joint Special Operations Task Force headquarters. And he was, a, he was the dirtiest one of all, Major Scott Ukiley. And he sabotaged us, he drafted up this brief, uh, totally condemning us. He, uh, he threw every stone he could find against me and our task force. Uh, and why you would do that to your own that you're sent over there right. 
to right. advocate for is despicable. We, it's and the thing is, is you know, especially especially for the Marine Corps, where you know, esprit de corps, you know, semper fidelis, where that is that is like the blood that is supposed to run mm -hmm. through the vein of a Marine, and it's always not, faithful. Yeah, always faithful, and it's not that you know, it's not that that would justify a cover up, but it would certainly justify even hadness, fair treatment, and and the desire, the desire to see your Marine Corps unblemished and unstained instead of just like, oh yeah, these guys must be guilty. Because because the Taliban and AQ have never, ever lied about anything. Oh no. Straight straight shooters. Yeah, that's not a tactic that they use. Yeah, um, and then so one, the one last uh, thing is, God rest his soul, late Congressman Walter Jones. He did fight for us, literally to death. Um, he received an injury and he ended up dying slowly. Uh, but he always told me, he said, Major Galvin, if it's the last thing I do, I will clear your Marines' names. And so he sponsored House Resolution. 21 in the 115th Congress. And for that two year congressional session uh, from 2017 to 2019, unfortunately, unfortunately, until the day he died, it fell on deaf ears. And the purpose of that is says that you can Google search age period, RAS period 21 in the 115th Congress. And it says to have the Commandant of the Marine Corps make a public statement stating that the Marines of Marine Special Operations Company Foxtrot were not at fault in the ambush on 4 March. Sat on deaf ears, the Commandant was indifferent. Did nothing indifferent, didn't clear our names. And people say, well, you know that you guys were finally exonerated. And let me be very clear about this. The Department of Navy had senior civilians that did an investigation. It was released the day after General Mattis was fired. General Mattis was a convening authority in our case. Uh, Mattis was fired. And on the 2nd of January, 2019, uh, this uh, panel that had been formed in May of the previous year, who knows, I mean, if the Secretary of Defense was the boss in this investigation, now he's the boss of the Pentagon, you're probably going to be really careful. But the day he was fired, this thing came released, and it's a 12-page report. Um, I know Nick Kaufman, when he's in soft rep, released the whole thing, and there's a link out there. And soft rep has this uh, 12 page report and it is explicit. My attorney was like, Fred, I've worked on these cases my whole career and I've with the department of defense. All I usually see is a one page. It's so vague. You don't, you don't even know who they're talking about or what happened. Mm -hmm. you just know that the petitioner is now clear because in your case, they name names in the verbiage in there, which is included in the book, a few bad men uh, is so over the top that they described who was immoral and unethical. They wow. said things were unjust. It completely exonerated us, but I'll go back and be very clear about what I first said. That was senior civilian leaders in the department of Navy and Marines of the department were the men's department, but we're in the department of the Navy and that's, but they set the record straight in 2019. So uh, yes, we've been cleared. We've been fully exonerated. I just wish, there was moral courage demonstrated by the senior leaders. Uh, we talk in the Marine Corps about, you know, standing up for your Marines, looking out for the morale. Uh, where is it right now in the MARSOC 3 case? You think those Marines and their wives and their kids have high morale? I mean, two of them were selected for promotion to include the chief who's, he's, his case has been dismissed. They still haven't promoted him. He was selected for promotion. That's, I mean, the whole thing started because they were out you know, yeah, they're enjoying themselves right. uh, because of promotion. Right. Three and a half years later, there. Do you think that's? You think you're looking out for people's morale? Right. Even after a guy's case is dismissed. Right. He's not promoted. Right. Fred, yeah. the the next point I wanted to get into, and I mean, I think you did a really amazing job outlining this and documenting all of it, and I'm really glad that you wrote this book to to tell the story of yourself and your men. Um, but I did want to circle back around on one point. Um. If from your perspective, a lot of this that when, when I say this doesn't make sense, what is this about? Um, if from your perspective, a conclusion that you, it, it, tell me if I'm wrong, 
was that a lot of this had to do with the Marine Corps just did not want MARSOC. Um, you alluded to that this was not something, this was the redheaded stepchild within the Marine Corps from the get-go. There is no long-term planning for it as if they plan to dissolve it um, before too long anyway. And now this incident happened and this was uh, a great, um, you know, never let a crisis go to waste, right? This, this, was, this was the opportunity to just disband MARSOC entirely. Yes, and I will say things completely unclassified here that Right now, down in Tampa and Special Operations Command, there's still those there's there's plans to scuttle MARSOC. It's really? Not that it was ever wanted. And then to this day, Dave and Jack, do you think there's plan to similar with the use of SOC? Do you think they're gonna mm-hmm. roll up the flag down there and brag and shut it down? No. Uh, no. When you look at what happened, when you talk about senior leader corruption, uh, Am I making something up that you had a uh, general you, the last commanding general of uh, Marine Special Operations Command? He uh, made some land acquisition right outside of Camp Lejeune and decided, made the order to these two Marine Raider battalions, the, the only two in Camp Lejeune, or Camp Pendleton, to move to Camp Lejeune. I mean, uh, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, did he get punished? No, he got selected for his third star, but he just quietly, he made it, he made a decision. Mm-hmm. He just was going to retire. Have you guys ever known a two-star general that selected for his third star and just walks, walks it off? You know, like, yeah, I got some other, he, he doesn't have any better <laughs> offers on the table. Who, who does that? Uh, but the problem is we're tone deaf. We got problems in our Marine Corps uh, the senior leaders to include in the Marine Special Operations Command. I'm telling you, trends. This isn't good. Currently, we have three Marine Special Operators. And one is a corpsman. Uh, they won't even. That's a whole other stupid story that they won't even. The Navy won't allow them to be called Raiders. Uh, but uh, can you imagine? You know, in any other service that you go through this training and you do the same mission, but you're not a. Uh, you know, you're not a full fledged member, but anyway, but, uh, we got problems when our guys right now who are out there are mistreated like this. Right. There's a reason that these guys just want to get out at 20 years here. I just, I left the military last month and all these guys, you know, most of which I knew and was friends with went from, uh, enlisted to officer and they're like at 20 years and one day I'm retiring. They don't want, when they can't say anything about it because there's some of these, hot button topics they're like endangered species that you really can't say anything about or you're going to be you know taken back and you know buried in a shallow grave uh, but the morale is so low right now this is an issue i'm not the unfaithful one that's breaking ranks i'm just the one making everybody aware that we've got a problem we got to mm-hmm. take a close examination what are you trained at when you know you get hit you know you do an evaluation you check yourself like what other injuries do i have right. you don't ignore it and sit there and like, God, that'll go away. You know, no, we have to pay attention to what's going on right now. If we plan to be effective against these great power competition fights that we're going to face in the future. So the, the book is A Few Bad Men, the true story of U.S. Marines ambushed in Afghanistan and betrayed in America by our guest, Major Fred Galvin. Fred, uh, start wrapping things up here. Uh, I, I think we understand at this point why you wrote the book. I, th- yeah. I think everyone gets you. You're pretty passionate and fired up about and, and this. And it needs to, it's a story that needs to be told. And like, at, at some point, you know, at some point, the commandant of the Marine Corps needs to, whoever it is, at whatever point in time, needs to come out and publicly state these guys yeah. were innocent. And what what yes. was what was the process like writing the book? Were there any new revelations that that you dug up during the process of writing this um, what, has there been a response from any of your men, your peers, uh, to the book so far? A good question. You know, the thing is, just factually stating, done hundreds of interviews uh, since I retired in 2014. Um, really started going public in the media in 2015. Um, the Marine Corps has not disputed a single word, anything that I said, and. As a retired officer, there is no statute of limitations for misconduct. So uh, they could, I'm on the pension. They can come back and prosecute me for anything, uh, anything misconduct. So, but 
uh, the Marines, especially those on the ambush, you know, they've constantly, you know, they're, they're glad and they want to see this out, uh, tell our side of the story, the full, the full events. Uh, but, you know, the, I will also say this six months ago when this book was announced, it's coming out. I had a, a LinkedIn account and a Twitter account that were created. Uh, one said I was a Lieutenant Colonel, which I've never been promoted to Lieutenant Colonel with others, but these fictitious accounts saying I was crazy. I was dying. And I was going to, you know, painting me as this madman. Uh, a month ago, I had my Facebook account hacked uh, with a, a link in there that was sent out from my own Facebook account. So all family and friends that I know got this thing. And I think they saw the sales of the book trending, you know, as a number one <laughs> new release. And uh, as I'd send stuff out to family and friends that, you know, this uh, kind of corrupted that and set it back a little bit. So, uh, but there is a lot of this information warfare. I saw this uh, one gentleman on LinkedIn saying, oh, you know, uh, don't buy this book. It's a book of gripes by Fred Galvin. And I'm like, a book of gripes, a little bit more than yeah. Mark yeah. S. I said, okay, Mark Sutton, uh, <laughs> it hasn't been published yet. How do you know what's inside it? Uh, isn't that censure? I mean, do you, is that what you're advocating for? Or is it because your, your brother is in a, a military attorney, a Lieutenant Colonel at headquarters Marine Corps and the staff judge advocate division. I mean, I think he probably does know what's inside here because it's gone through the Pentagon's office pre-publication security review. So I will say that some high level leaders probably aren't so uh, thrilled. This is not going to be on the commandant's reading list. <laughs> right. It's probably not going to be in any military post exchanges bookstore. But if America wants to know the health mm -hmm. of the military, they need to understand the good and the bad. Yeah. And I'm not talking about all the good things that people have done. Now this book has its, and I equate this to the candy. It's got our combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, but the trial is the meat and potatoes. So don't get filled up on, yeah. you know, the, the hors d'oeuvres and the dinner mint. You know, you want to get into that trial and you'll see this is the stuff that makes it extraordinary. This should never have happened, nor should it ever happen again. But it's going to. And just like evidence with these guys in the MARSOC 3, we've got a problem and we cannot ignore it. When you if you have something terminal in your life, cancer or, you know, if you were the young Green Beret that went out and married the stripper uh, and she's just spending your money, you've got to make a decision and take some action and survive because if you don't you're it's going to end up you know killing you the book comes out in just a couple days june 7th uh it's up for pre-order now on amazon uh, i'm definitely going to order a copy you you shared the a pdf with me but i, I want to get a hard copy yeah. of this book fred a um, few bad men check it out it's it's it'll depress you <laughs> it'll shock yeah. you and depress you uh but One definitely thing about check it, it out gentlemen is it's with supply chain issues, I recommend pre-ordering it. That's what I'll say. Don't uh, don't try to wait to pick it up at a bookstore as there's likely going to be uh, some disappointment from you. Don't wait till after the 7th. Uh, algorithms figure the amount of production. Yeah. Uh, so if you pre-order it, you will spend what the publisher says, you'll be guaranteed a copy. All right, Fred. Uh, you, they don't uh, charge you until it actually ships. Tw twist in my arm with your sales pitch. I'm going to go <laughs> ahead and pre-order it now. Pre <laughs> um, since I'm on the page. So it's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books and Million, the, wherever books are sold. And, and, and the link is down in the description, guys. Yeah. Um, so it's easy to, to get, a, get a copy of it. Um, so if if you're a, a caveman and you don't like to read, it is uh, on Audible, so you can have it read to you. Uh, it's on Kindle, for those that like uh, Kindle. Uh, the book does have all the diagrams, glossary of acronyms and terms. It's very well written by Salmana. It's easy to understand. Uh, anybody in your family, a young kid can understand what's going on in this book. Yeah. I, I, I think that uh, some people are going to be very shocked. And look, I, I know you've had your day in court. I hope you, I hope that you and the other members of Marsoc have like your, your day in the press. I hope that, that there is widespread acknowledgement of, not only your innocence, but a bit, but the the hostile actions that were taking taken by people in your own ranks against you, and and the unjustified host, 
hostile actions. That and we need to have uh, military justice reform, uh, just like the case of this MARSOC 3. Um, mm -hmm. Similar to what's going on in sexual assault in the military, that has shown precedence as, you know, they're taking that out of the hands of the military. I know there's a lot in the Pentagon senior ranks of like, we can't lose control of our military justice. But when you're proven that you can't do it, you have, right. a, you have this unlawful command influence. Yeah. When you have to influence the military defense attorneys by threats. Right. You're not big boys. Well, and, you and, know, and, and that's we've not, lost our way. Yeah. And that's not just in your case. Like Jack's talked about this and written about this extensively, too. That it goes the other way sometimes where where like in civil case, when there are cases on bases and things like that that are very real, the command for its own self-interest will brush them under, you know, like like there needs to be. Yeah, there's a very weird dynamic that I've never quite understood about the military about how they will really persecute people who didn't do anything wrong. Right. Oh, but then they will sweep things under the rug where people really did some bad things. And um I, is that usually a, senior officers? Yes, uh, but and and it does feel more like a feature than a bug, unfortunately, of the system. Um, Fred, uh, just a couple questions from uh, viewers before I let you go. How likely is it that MARSOC will have a counterterrorism contribution to JSOC, and what advantage would could they bring to the fold in comparison to some of the other special mission units? Yeah, I'm not able to officially speak on their part. I'm not part of that command, but I would say highly unlikely. Highly unlikely means probably won't happen. Uh, but what could they do? Um, I'll just say they've been doing it uh, in small numbers is all I'll say. Uh, JSOC is a joint command. I'll leave it at that. And uh, those men have, which uh, I have tons of friends and close respect for, uh, have been doing it at the highest levels. And one thing Marines, uh, it's like a cult. It's very, uh, I mean, they do a good job at brainwashing guys and getting these guys to, to do extreme things. Uh, since the hit, I mean, Marines were coming alongside in ships, swinging over in ropes with swords, uh, killing people. That's, that's some pretty wild stuff. <laughs> and, uh, you know, some, from some of the earliest days, uh, in the American revolution. So, uh, Marines can definitely, if they had been given that opportunity it, as a organic Marine force, that would be a phenomenal portion of our national security. But uh, I doubt that'll ever happen. Unfortunately, BP Izzy, thank you for, uh, thank you for your donation. Again, our guest, Fred Galvin, the book is a few bad men up for pre-order on Amazon. Uh, next episode is going to be Kim Carruthers, this dude served in the Ranger Battalion in Special Forces in Worse and served as a, and also worked as a private security contractor. Kim has, I think he's one of those dudes that kind of did it all. I'm really excited to talk to him. I've been going back. Um, he's all teed up for next week. So really excited to have him on the show. And uh, we'll see you guys next Friday. Fred, thank you again for coming on the show, doing this interview, writing this book, and telling the story of, uh, of your men and, and what really happened out there. Yeah, thank you, Fred. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much for letting me uh, get this word out to your listeners. Really appreciate it. Absolutely, folks. So we'll see everyone next Friday. Thanks, everyone. Buy the book. That's right.